Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining. That should be enough time for those trying to end their last Zoom call and jumping to the next one. We have a fantastic session for you, so let's begin. My name is Josie Waite and I'm Community Manager for Fintra and the Fintech FinCrime Exchange. Welcome to our APAC focused webinar, An Integrated Approach to Fighting Financial Crime. Zoom has certainly been a staple of my working life, but just in case there are some that are not familiar, here is how it all works. We are using the webinar function, so all attendees will have their microphones and videos disabled. Don't be alarmed if we cannot see or hear you. Please may I direct everyone to the QA function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen to raise any questions during the session. We encourage participation in the session, so please don't be shy. Our moderator will do her very best to filter all questions received to our lovely speakers. In the event we can't get through all the questions, we will try, try to answer them after the event and look to provide email responses. We would be extremely grateful if you could please share with us some feedback post webinar. You will receive a feedback form via an email from Zoom following the session. Please do share with us your thoughts, positive or negative, as they are super useful for us when organizing and creating these sessions. And of course, as some of us are still working from home, all children and pets are very welcome. What is the FinTech FinCrime Exchange? Conscious for some that this may be their first FinTech FinCrime Exchange event, so let me share with you all who we are. In short, the FFE is a global community of FinTech anti-financial crime professionals united in the fight against financial crime. As a community, we collaborate on best practices in financial crime risk management, and mostly by sharing information on criminal typologies, yet the value of the community goes far beyond the sharing of those typologies. We try and do as much as we can to enhance the resilience, resilience and robustness of the sector, which includes our meetups, sharing thought leadership, engaging in law enforcement, producing a podcast and hosting events such as this. Included on the slide, there are some numbers to put the community into perspective. And thank you to our sponsors of the FFE, Jumio and Comply Advantage. Without them, we would not be able to make the FFE possible. And thank you also to them for collaborating on this webinar with us. To save us all from a Josie monologue, because I could go on for days about all the wonderful things that FFE does, if you would like to discover more about the community, please do visit our FFE website. I will make sure I pop the web address in the chat after the panel discussion, along with the contact email. We have an expert lineup of leading anti-financial crime professionals for today's discussion. Nerf has Lynn Mahavad Kunju from Mai Mai, Heather Tan from Comply Advantage, Uthra Pamaswaran from Stash Away, and Frederick Ho from Jumio. And moderating the discussion will, will be my lovely colleague, Sara Abassi, APAC consultant at Pintrell. Now, Sara, I will now hand over to you for the discussion. Thanks, Josie, and welcome everyone to our APAC-focused FFE webinar. Um, my name is Sara, and I will be moderating the event today. So firstly, I'd like to thank you all for joining. Um, the focus for today's webinar is to discuss this notion of an integrated approach to financial crime. And with this, we'll be exploring how the digital landscape has evolved in recent years, particularly around the adoption of regulatory technology and artificial intelligence. Then we'll look to discuss how businesses should approach choosing the right AML and, and KYC technology. And finally, we'll end our discussion looking at the future of technology and how we see any regulatory develop, developments evolving and what this will mean for both the fintech and the regtech industry. So today we are joined by a panel of experts from both the regtech side, but also some compliance professionals from the fintech industry. So before we get started, um, I would like to hand over to my panel to introduce themselves. So no, you're first on my screen. Shall we start with you? Sure, Sarah, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Noor Fazlim Binti M. Muhammad Kunju. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer uh, for My My Payment Malaysia Sunyam Berhad. We are a new fintech entity that has been approved with a large scheme e-wallet uh, electronic money uh, licensing in, in, in Malaysia under Bank Negara, Malaysia. So uh, I've been in fintech sphere for the last uh, five years and I've been in the brick and mortar for the last uh, 10 years. So approximately I have around 15 years of experience for handling end-to-end -end compliance for uh, 
money services, business industries, and also fintech and ecosystem entities. Thank you. Thanks, Mira. Um, Arthur, go next. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Uttra, and I'm part of the um, Stash Away group. Uh, Stash Away is a robo financial advisor which started off in Singapore four years ago, and then we have kind of expanded to five, four geographies, and the fifth one is coming up soon. And I joined Stash Away about seven months ago to manage the leadership for compliance and operational risk and enterprise-wide risk as well. Uh, I guess if I have to bundle up my experience, a fair bit of my uh, time has been spent on the traditional side of things, starting with investment bank and institutional equities. Moving on, um, I spent a decade in the fund management industries across conventional real funds as well as um, real estate funds. I have a consolidated experience of two and a half years in the fintech space where half of it has been as a blockchain startup and now I'm with um, Stash Away. So yes, I'm happy to share my thoughts on the space and um, well, we can, we can all imagine that the space is ever evolving and the challenges are always interesting. Talk to you all soon, yeah. Thanks, Ifra. Cedric, do you want to go next? Hi, Sarah. Uh, very good afternoon to all attendees and to my fellow panelists. Uh, so I'm, I'm Frederick, um, Vice President for APEC in the, in, uh, for Jumio in APEC region. Uh, um, with myself and my team, uh, we, we have been looking after clients who are uh, putting, moving their business to a digital platform, and we uh, specifically provide technologies around uh, online identity verification so uh, we, we have been operating in, in this market for over 11 years now, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing some uh, feedback uh, to the questions that the, uh, the host has uh, arranged for us today. Thanks, Frederick. And finally, Heather, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Heather, and it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you today alongside with today's expert panelists. Uh, for those of you who've joined us, you know, from the region um, and all around the world, thanks very much for taking the time. Comply Advantage is a UK-based rec tech with Singapore operating as its APEC headquarters. Um, we've been around for the past seven years and our goal is really to fuel innovation in AML screening, um, transaction monitoring to fight financial crime and terrorism. I spent close to a decade now working within the AML technology space, helping financial institutions uh, and fintech and payment companies within the region. My background has been in working with a more traditional type of institutions previously, uh, as well as some of the non-financial institutions like high-risk corporates. And in the more recent years, I'm primarily focused on working with fintechs. So really happy to be here speaking with you today. Great, thanks Heather. Um, so I think we're ready to get started then. Um, so first question, I think we'll start with you now. Um, given your experience as a compliance professional who has worked for several fintechs, but also non-fintech organizations, um, over the years, in your opinion, how has the digital landscape changed in terms of fighting financial crime? Well, to be honest, uh, crimes are more sophisticated in digital ecosystem, and it's gonna be a a challenge for the regulators to step up and keep up with the dynamic environment. And, and apparently in a fintech ecosystem, KYC is actually the backbone for compliance. So eKYC is the most imperative system to support digital landscape. And of course, nowadays eKYC can be automated so that the customer due diligence is no longer being done manually, right? And I think as, far, as compared to in the brick and mortar industry, uh, to identify the financial crime is more realistic and more lively, but it is more manualized and it's much more slower. As compared to digital ecosystem, we can uh, have rule-based activities, rule-based monitoring, and we will be able to identify uh, the financial crime uh, in a more faster manner and more efficient. And of course, uh, there, are, there are some gaps uh, as compared to brick and mortar, but I think over the years, the artificial intelligence technology also is really helping in order to get all these predictive models uh, to understand and train the system so that we'll be able to capture 
uh, financial crimes activity more efficiently. That's my take on it. Great, thanks, No. And so given there has been this adoption of, um, of artificial intelligence and EKYC reg tech over the years, um, Ufra, from your perspective, um, what do you believe the regulator's uh, opinion or perspective on this adoption of um, AI and reg tech technology has been? Sorry, Ufra, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. So yeah, so we all uh, understand that you know AI has its own share of advantages, and, and when it comes to fighting financial crime, uh, it kind of really brings in a lot of speed and efficiency into complex transactions monitoring space. And you know what we all don't like is about um, you know the false positives. So it kind of cre creates a liberating feeling where you know those false positive alerts are much reduced. So definitely there is a fair share of advantage to this technology and. Um, and, and and there are there are those transformative changes which cannot be ignored. Now the thing here is that it's not that the regulators don't understand it. They are very technology neutral. They are fully aware and they do see the transformative potential of these technologies. But having said that, uh, specific to AI and the AML side of things, regulators do have concerns around a few areas that comes along with this technology how do you kind of um, establish auditability? How do you kind of establish explainability and what, what you call as interpretability, right? So uh, what really happens in, or, you know, in a very layman term, the AI is a machine that could take on decisions uh, with the use of data and layers of data. The problem is that the user using that may not be able to understand or explain how the AI arrived at a certain decision. So as compliance officers or people in the business, it is just not always black and white. So whenever there is a context of gray involved, you need to kind of demonstrate the rationale and the thinking behind arriving at a decision making. So somewhere the AI prejudices that opportunity. And it's also believed that AI and machine learning come with a share of biases of the creator. So all of these are things I'm sure with time, it will get better and better. But what we look at AI is a well full, fully machine driven data analysis and leading on to a decision making approach. The minute you have, uh, you know, what we call as pre programmed arrangements or rules, rules based AML monitoring is something we all have been doing over the past decade. Now, in an AI context, when you introduce that, it kind of challenges the performance of the artificial intelligence and what the machine is optimally supposed to do. So from a business perspective, that balance needs to be uh, met. And that's one of the things where the regulators often talk about in terms of how, how, how do we manage this? I think another striking feature, it's not the regulatory concern, it's just the way the regulations have evolved is about data. So AI is all about data, more data and lots of data and churning data to come up with analysis and stuff, which means that uh, how, how, how do these things play in the world of GDPR restrictions? How do these things play in terms of um, using the AI from a business perspective to run gro global businesses? And how, how, how do all of this uh, come together and you know not really kind of uh, breach the requirements of uh, GDPR regulation that exists. So I think primarily uh, regulators, I, I hear regulators talking about these two areas of uh, concern when they kind of um, talk about AI and machine learning. Great, thanks, Ufra. Um, we have had a question come through, which I think um, might make sense to answer it now rather than wait to the end. So uh, this is for you, Nur. Uh, with regards to uh, EKYC, what are some of the gaps that you have identified and can you share at least one to two scenarios on this? Well, actually, okay, in terms of, say again, the questions. Um, so with regards to EKYC, what are those gaps that you mentioned and can you share at least one to two scenarios? Okay, basically uh, by having an EKYC system, uh, most importantly is actually to mitigate uh, fraud transactions and also fraud uh, identification by the customers, right? So by having by having EKYC system, I think I've seen vast uh, cases uh, in in my previous experiences whereby a uh, customer able uh, to forge the identity document, and we have also discovered in terms of identity theft. 
whereby a customer is actually uh, frauding the their identity document, I, uh, my, my card, and uh, they are able to perform the transactions. So these are some of the areas whereby uh, by having by having lots of predictive models, so that we will be able uh, to train our system to identify efficiently on how to identify forged document. Because uh, most importantly for EKYC system to be able uh, to discover fraudulent documentations and the predictive model uh, by the EKYC system, the way they run the system, we need to be able to discover all these cases. And there are some uh, good systems uh, that I've utilized before. I think I've utilized lots of system before, like on Fido, Dumio, Innovative, ID Mission. There's a lot of EKYC system that I've, I've uh, utilized in my past experiences and also in my current experience. So uh, most of the EKYC system, they upkeep uh, with, their, with their sophistication. And these are some of the good systems that actually uh, the industry player need to know and they need to adopt into their uh, ecosystem if they are really going for uh, fintech uh, entities. Okay, thanks, Mo. And that actually leads quite nicely on to the, the next question, which is um, one for, for all of the panel here. Um, for businesses, when it comes to choosing the right technology, um, what considerations do you think people should be taking into account for choosing the right AML and KYC technology? I think we'll start with you, Frederick, if you'd like to answer this one. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think primarily there will always be uh, a, a few pillars of consideration uh, when you're planning a business, say you're planning, uh, you know, the how you're going to do digital onboarding. Um, I mean, of course, there's the uh, business objectives. Uh, there are regulations that you have got to comply with. You've got to think about security. Uh, whether, like uh, Nu has mentioned, you know, how do you deal with all these identity, uh, identity threat possibilities? So uh, you've got to manage all these because out, at the end of the day, there is a business outcome that you're, you're really uh, targeting to achieve. So maybe to touch on a few points will be the, uh, areas like um, the, the market coverage of your business. Are you planning only to launch in a single country uh, or are you looking at uh, a larger region or even global business? Then the platform that you think about ought to give you that one step directly into these uh, single or multiple markets that you are uh, considering. Uh, secondly, also like what Noor has uh, mentioned, there's so much exception handling. You, know, you, you cannot predict that an end user would give you the perfect flow the outcome, you know, that everything will be right. And when you uh, have got to uh, automate as much as you can, because that is about cost efficiencies, then you have got to think about when exceptions happen, who's going to do it? Is the vendor that you engage with taking care of that? Or are you going to put headcount behind it? Because the one other thing that you may hope to achieve uh, that uh, ultimately if technology can get you there is uh, a straight through processing that you know, from A to Z, like um, my uh, technology design has taken me a, you know, uh, in, a, in a way that I have minimized my overhead and my cost, and, and yet I've got to where I want. But, but then again, technology is also a double-edged sword, right? It can give you the business outcome, but it can also hurt you, right? So the way that you implement has got big implications on your brand. No, if, if you're going to do a big bang of uh, uh, your great business idea and you're going to launch it to the market, you, you want to have the biggest impact on day one because that is what the market is going to remember you and recognize you for that service you're going to deliver. So a, a lot of orchestration happens behind this to make sure this whole topic about user experience, uh, did they say they love it? Did they say they hate it? Uh, what was the outcome that you have achieved in, in that uh, in the initial two months, three months of, of, your, of your business launch. I think ultimately, of course, um, all these combination means that uh, uh, the kind of balance you must achieve. Uh, and uh, of course, working with industry experts, looking at where technology can make an impact and, and where there are limitations and we, we have to acknowledge that. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, it is a instrument to the business outcome. Right. And I think that all these are probably 
the different thinking points about uh, what what vendor, what what kind of uh, architecture ultimately would be suitable for you. I do agree with Frederick because actually, uh, in terms of uh, business requirements, uh, you need to customize what sort of uh, system that you need to use for your company. For example, if let's say you are only a remittance service provider in Malaysia. So you might be able to use a much more uh, lower scale of uh, EKYC system. But if you're looking for a cross-border transfer, you are looking for a domestic payment, then I think you would need, need to be able to have a very robust EKYC system that able to not only identify the recipients or the sender, uh, the, that is not only able to identify the identity of the sender, but also able to verify the identity of the of the receiver for example in terms of cross border transfer uh, in some regions uh, that i experienced before in australia in brunei and malaysia itself sometimes whenever you are sending the money for a foreign worker and they are in a, in another region so we need to be able to verify also the authenticity of the recipient so if you are just uh, basing yourself in Malaysia itself, for example, maybe you can utilize a very, a very low scale EKYC system. But if you're looking for a very huge businesses and multiple products, for example, the e-wallet entities in Malaysia, we have humongous products that we can apply to Bank Negara. And these businesses is really scalable. So then you need to really consider to have a very good EKYC system. For example, my company, we are utilizing Jumio for now. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, um, Heather, from, from your perspective, what do you what do you believe businesses should be taking into consideration when choosing the right technology? I really agree with what Frederick and um, Nerth already mentioned in terms of, you know, one, um, the data capabilities, making sure that the vendors that you select, you know, have the right kind of um, data or, you know, subject matter um, capabilities. This could be either global or geographical um, specific. But I think another thing just to add is even when we look at Asia as a whole, if a vendor says, you know, we're strong with Asia coverage, there's so many different nuances within Asia alone. If we take the example of Malaysia, um, the different kinds of salutations, uh, and if we look at just the titles, Dato, the way it's spelled, um, D-A-T-O, D-A-T-U-K, there's so many different um, you know, subtle variations in just the way you handle names. And I think it's just very important to identify um, providers who can uh, manage the different kinds of the nuances um, in each market that um, you're looking at. Uh, I also agree earlier, uh, Utra mentioned in a uh, point, you know, the importance of data and information security. And Frederick also talked about that, uh, just making sure that these are, you know, meeting the local regulatory standards and aligned with your business plans as you scale into other markets. But the two points that I wanted to add is one, just looking at how a system that you choose to use is going to be flexible and adaptable to the way your business grows. The fintech space is always evolving, right? Um, today, you may launch in, you know, a certain segment, but may choose to introduce new product uh, lines of businesses and in, grow into new markets. Um, in each of those scenarios, the regulatory uh, requirements will differ. The type of customers that you work with as well can be quite different. And so just looking at a system that can take on and adapt to these changes. Uh, the, the other thing to also consider is the flexibility to adapt to different segmentation of customers, right? Looking at in individual retail versus corporate customers, uh, also looking at the volume of customers that you engage with um, those uh, from a, you know, data and customer onboarding perspective, um, just being able to customize the type of sources you want to screen against so you get tighter results that come back versus from a transaction monitoring perspective, being able to customize the rules, thresholds to again, give you better type of results. Um, and just the last piece I wanted to add is looking at the long-term resource requirements of a system, whether or not, you know, regular maintenance is going to be provided, um, continuous subject matter expertise to make sure that the platforms are uh, kept up to date with regulatory changes. 
Okay, thanks, Heather. And then finally, Uthra, from your perspective, are there any other considerations or have they largely been covered? Yes, they, they've been covered uh, by all of them, but uh, there's just one um, dimension I want to mention to the uh, participants out here is that, um, yeah, so the, the, the question is about how do you choose the technology for your AML, but I think I would take a step back to see what would be my AML program on the whole. So it necessarily doesn't have to be 100% technology. Uh, and to me, a well-oiled AML program is a combination of um, people, the processes, the governance levels, and technology actually complementing and bringing efficiencies to these levels of requirements. So that's one thing I will look at when I say, like, uh, when do you have to have a technology? I, I do know that many very early stage uh, fintech firms, let's say, think people who are in a series A or B, will have cost considerations to be met when they look at technology. So while we have a lot of technology available in this space, they are not particularly very, very cost effective in many ways, for especially scales which are smaller and for people who are in the startup phase. But the requirements to manage an AML application is the same just because they are a licensed entity. Nothing really changes for them from a big bank perspective. So it is another very important consideration to have a broader AML program and to understand how much technology you need to introduce at what phase of uh, of at what phase your organization is at. So, and, and then also look at the next two, three to five years before actually making a sizable investment into uh, technology. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, a common theme there was um, needing the technology to be adaptable and also flexible. Um, so I think this brings us on to our, our next segment, which looks at the future then. Um, so let's start with you, Noah. What do you believe is the biggest um, challenges for fintechs to overcome in the future? Well, I think uh, number one is actually for the compliance to upkeep the knowledge because a uh, financial crime is getting sophisticated. Number two, uh, in terms of the scalability for the small startups through volume, because actually greater competition as encouraged by the regulated environment, banks have reputational legacy uh, and they, they can overcome. But in terms of fintech uh, entities, they need to have volume of business businesses and uh, being uh, disrupted to the banks, they really need to get the volume, then only they will be able to be at par at the bank and how the bank are doing businesses. And I think uh, in terms of the customer loyalty and acceptance, okay, usually millennials are very supportive towards FinTech entities, but that they, but they doesn't have the wealth needed to support the product to scale. As compared to those who are rich and wealthy, those millionaires, they prefer to go for the bank uh, to do their transactions, right? But uh, things are changing and evolving. But uh, apparently the fintech entities, they will need to have uh, the volume, then only they will be able to grow faster. And that's why also you can see why lots of fintech entities, they are relying on the investors on crowdfunding uh, in order to uh, upkeep to the business requirement and, and also to upkeep to the regulatory requirement, which is getting stringent, okay? But as, as compared to the banks, they have the financial capability. Bank had been historically thousands, uh, hundreds of years already in, in, in any part of the world. So they have the financial capability. They don't, they don't really have to rely on the investors, okay? And then uh, in terms of the investors also, uh, what I can see uh, when FinTech entity is actually relying on the investors, that there might be tendency uh, for the FinTech entities to bend the rules in order to scale the business faster and bigger. And as compared to the banks, they have the capital, they have the profitability to protect themselves or even to pay the regulatory fines that have been imposed by the regulators. Okay. Uh, okay. I think that's all from my end. Maybe uh, other panelists also can provide their yeah, insightful points. Yeah, I think, um, I think you mentioned there, obviously, the regulatory developments um, potentially becoming more stringent or others may agree or may disagree. Um, but Heather, starting with you, how well do you believe fintechs are responding to these regulatory developments? 
So I agree with what, I mean, Nora said, uh, which was mentioned earlier in her point as well. It really depends if you're a series A or B, then cost is a huge factor, right? Um, let's take FinTechs in Singapore as an example, even though the uh, payment Service Act was released a couple of years ago. Uh, we're still seeing now that a lot of companies have yet to fully implement an end-to-end -end sort of AML um, policy and procedures. Uh, they do, however, often start with uh, an MVP, right? So I think one um, resource limitation has been a huge factor um, for startups where they're a lot leaner in nature, that often means that product and user experience uh, takes a stance stage when it comes to allocating engineering and developmental resources. Um, and therefore, unfortunately, compliance takes a backseat where many compliance officers uh, you know, do roll up policies and procedures. It's hard to push through to get uh, resources allocated there. Um, they then you know, would rely, I think, as a first step on external KYC solutions, because that's a fairly um, lower cost solution and relies a lot on external data um, that's available. And, and so it's an easier start. But then when we look at things like transaction monitoring, where the implementation process is more complex, um, external investment could be higher, then the consideration often comes down to uh, should they build or should they buy uh, uh, and again, another conversation as to where developmental resources should be allocated, right? I think the second challenge we see is that profit margins are eroding. Uh, so if we take the cross-border payment industry alone, uh, it's grown in the past one year uh, or its growth has really been the equivalent of what we've seen in the past 10 years combined. Uh, and it's still expected to grow 11% year on year. Uh, unfortunately though, despite all of the growth, there's been a lot of new entrants into the market. And this also means tougher competition where the profit margin for every single transaction is being eroded, right? In such a scenario, fintechs would then find themselves needing to keep up with the regulatory challenges. Um, as as Nur mentioned, you know, they they would not be different than if you were operating in a bank, but you don't have the same kinds of budgets. Uh, you then look at the cost of onboarding one single customer, and that against a transaction. And then it just becomes a more challenging conversation. I say this though, uh, that this, you know, often applies to a higher volume type of transaction business. Uh, whereas there are still businesses out there where they have a smaller pool of customers and each customer transaction at a higher value in those scenarios, then it would be a slightly different competition. Um, I, I think fortunately in this part of the world, uh, the regulators have been extremely supportive in providing the necessary guidance um, community in Australia, for example, there's a lot of very good materials on, on Austrac that um, you know would be applicable to the rest of the region uh, that, that is worth looking at. In Singapore, the MAS has issued a new RegTech grant to support a lot of fintechs in getting the right kind of compliance processes in place. So I, I definitely think um, there is a, a shift, but there is still a lot of gap um, that we have to you know collectively kind of close. Thanks, Heather. And, and Frederick, from your perspective? Um, regulatory developments have been a very interesting topic uh, in the last couple of months. You know, um, big, big changes, big announcements, and you see market moves. And uh, I think that a lot of uh, us are following developments in that space. Um, and down, down to the brick and mortar, uh, again, is business decisions versus costs. I mean, pretty much Heather has covered uh, a lot of these decision points. But the nature of fintechs is that they, they are agile. Like, um, they, 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 they are about rapid growth uh, and that they easily scale very quickly. And, uh, you know, and, and that kind of uh, puts pressure on the regulators like, uh, in terms of the speed at which they're changing things around. And uh, the, also as a fintech, uh, number one is, uh, you know, they are pretty much global. So uh, as a global operation, then um, uh, the products that they offer internationally, and it goes beyond any one single uh, legislative, one regulatory body that's able to handle money movements from state A to state B. Uh, so uh, just a simple example would be just cryptocurrency. 
accepted in some countries, but not in others, right? So if, if the fintechs were to operate in this space, uh, and that was what gave them the competitive advantage, right? To be successful in, in where they are. And also successful because they are moving away from some uh, intermediaries. So we've got this, this uh, uh, intermediation. Uh, and with this in, uh, intermediation, then of course, some of these controls previously that was put in place uh, now have got to be you know, re-architect, right? How do we gonna do this? So I think regulators will always come from the perspective of, uh, I mean, at least in the last two years, three years, it's a bit of a, a wait and see. You know, uh, let's look at the other guys, uh, you know, how are they uh, are moving with their policies? Uh, what are they allowing? What are they not? Uh, and of course, you know, uh, the very popular concept of a sandbox. Let's, let's test stuff, you know, to see, you know, uh, how does it work within our space? So, I mean, really down to all these regulatory developments, what does it mean for the fintech? I, I will gravitate to whichever uh, 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 regula regulatory state, right? That would give me the best business advantage, depending on what my business uh, objectives are. Um, ha having the, a platform uh, that will give me reputation uh, that, oh, I comply to a certain regulation of the state, you know, I'm well tested, I'm secure, I'm safe, uh, maybe a springboard to a, a bigger market, right? Uh, or if let's say that I, I'm really best in uh, operating in a certain space and that, that guideline in the regulation itself would, would give me a sufficient protection where I can be, be successful. Uh, I, that's why the, the role of the regulators are really important. I mean, as on one hand, it is control to make sure that the financial system itself is stable and is safe. But number two, there is always that uh, economic nationalism uh, agenda that you want to promote an environment that will attract fintechs to come. And, and you can only do that uh, if you give them the breath that they are supposed to be agile, they should, to a, to a certain extent, be able to exhibit that. So, so that, that is my opinion. Thanks, Frederick. Um, and I think all of the panelists there touched upon this difference between the fintech environment and also traditional banking. So for, um, from your perspective, how do you believe the approach to these regulatory developments does differ between fintech and traditional banking environment? Okay, so whenever there is a regulatory development, uh, it, it only means that um, everybody needs to comply. There has never been a regulatory development that said that your businesses aren't small or big and you, you can kind of um, do things. But there's always this um, direction from regulators that you adopt controls that fit your size and scale of operations. So I guess both the um, type of organizations would then dwell upon what is that optimal state for me to make that decision. But the end story is that we all need to comply. So having said that, um, some of the uh, really interesting regulatory theme after the post pandemic uh, situation would be like uh, areas around credit risk, uh, operational model viability, um, operational resilience, sustainability, and all of that. So if I was to pick one of these theme and that's very close to the uh, financial crime discussion would be around the area of operational resilience. There is a lot of interest in this space and rightly so because the pandemic has actually shifted gears from what is a norm to a new norm today and how well we operate into it with a whole lot of stimulus and the job losses and the transformational things that happened in the last couple of years, there is bound to be crime. So financial crime and the entity's operational resilience towards that will be a very, very important topic that regulators will focus on, be it traditional or fintech. Uh, there seems to be this feeling that on the fintech space, there will be more vulnerability around this area because of the tech thing and there's a fair bit of crime expertise, if I may call on that space. But, but the reality is that um, on the traditional side of things, if you are a very large organization, when you look at BCP and stress testing and everything, it has become so real for everybody. It's always been those tests that we've done and that's all playing in real time for large organizations when they're seeing it happen. But it's still a very, very huge uh, mindset drift that traditional organizations have to go through to the problem of you know as simple as working from home. And uh, in, in spite 
the fact that we've all been working from home plus for a year plus now. Uh, so that will be one key thing that um, larger firms will have to tackle with. Whereas on the side of FinTech, I think um, when it comes to implementing controls, they are pretty quick. And like how Frederick said, the agility of the business kind of comes in very handy. They're able to, they will naturally go and embrace tech in the space when there are new controls. Uh, that's that's the way the whole DNA of a FinTech operates. So there will be more tech, uh, digitalization and innovation in that space to build in those controls and that side of things. And the agile operating model actually provides a little bit of advantage to the fintech in a shifting world. And it's kind of a little better position to tackle disruptive situations. Uh, but having said that, there is always a cost and an opportunity to any of these new regulations that come in. So the way uh, we think in the fintech space about this is that once we address the actual control problem, the, the entire organization starts thinking about where do we see the opportunity. So if there is um, just let's say in the funds world, you know, we, we saw a lot of these investment frauds and stuff, they would take your name and send WhatsApp messages to everybody and stuff. So once once we settle our house and make sure that our data is protected, which is the key concern, we will have somebody looking at it all the time. But the focus shifts on how do we utilize this as an opportunity to talk to our customers? How do we, and, and in Stashaway, educating the customer has been a very, very forefront approach. And we kind of tend to lean towards that model to teach customer the importance of resilience and how the controls have evolved over a period of time. So that gives us an opportunity to create a conversation with your customers who's actually far away when he is digital as against to a traditional world. But at the same time, you know, educate them and you know build their confidence actually in terms of situations that we all come across or they have come across with us. So that is kind of a very differentiating factor that I see in the world of fintechs and how, how we respond to some of these challenges. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have had a few uh, questions come through. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask my final question and then we'll go over to the, the audience questions. Um, so finally, to end then uh, with this hot topic of fraud versus AML, um, obviously with the, the digital transformation in mind, there are often two camps of compliance professionals, those that believe fraud and AML should be integrated versus those that believe they should be um, separated and assessed by separate teams. Um, so Noah, just to end with you, um, what is your stance on AML and fraud and how should the two financial crime types be approached? Well, my stance would be actually uh, fraud monitoring uh, is a different element and AML monitoring is to be taken in as a different element. For example, okay, for e-wallet entity, fraud monitoring is more on the EKYC checks and verification and AML is actually more on the analyzing the transactions and also the pattern analysis, okay? Uh, and comparing to uh, e-wallet entity space to uh, remittance service provider space, okay? Fraud monitoring and AML monitoring are captured more on trade-based money laundering cases, okay? Uh, phishing activities is also part of fraud. Uh, identity theft cases are also on part of the fraud monitoring that you are able to capture. So uh, apparently, AML and fraud monitoring is actually different ecosystem. You should be able to treat it separately, okay? And monitoring uh, fraud transactions, monitoring fraud activities, and monitoring AML activities is actually different uh, and it includes for any other illegal activities as well. So fraud is actually, uh, according to statistics by National Risk Assessment Malaysia, fraud is the highest uh, threat in Malaysia and it is required to set different parameters to detect and monitor fraud and AML to ensure a risk-based approach is met whenever you are performing for AML monitoring. Okay, and. Uh, for e-wallet entities, fraud monitoring is also on uh, specifically on the EKYC and also the mobile phone. And in terms of the AML transaction monitoring, it shall be covering on the smurfing activities, layering uh, activities, and also integration and uh, emerging trends for a system perspective. Okay, uh, company will need to be able to have all this robust system in place. Uh, considering if you're going to go for a fintech entity sphere, you need to be able to have all this robust system to upkeep with the trend because you must always remember uh, whatever regulations that being imposed by the regulators, always the criminals is seven steps higher than us. 
So you need to be able to upkeep your system accordingly and scale it accordingly also because uh, in terms of financial crime activities, uh, it's getting, it's getting uh, violent and there's a lot of areas how criminal activities is being conducted uh, considering uh, the system and the ecosystem world globally is being accelerated because of COVID-19 pandemic. You can see huge cybercrime activities is going on on a hike. So we need to be able to conduct fraud monitoring separately from EML monitoring. That's my that's my humble uh, stance. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, from from your perspective, is it the same or do you differ there? Um. Well, it starts off same, but I do have a slightly different approach to how, how you're doing it. Maybe I can just uh, share my thoughts on it. Well, I do agree completely with the traditional belief and what Noor has just mentioned, because fraud is fundamentally a prevention of uh, criminal activity. You look at fraud from the approach of not allowing your money to go out or get uh, you know leaked out or not allow data to go out. That's the whole concept of how fraud is looked at uh, fundamentally. Whereas AML on the other side is about, you know, a little bit of a postmodern activity. It, it focuses more on transaction monitoring and the patterns of um, a suspicious transaction. And it kind of focuses on detecting a behavioral aspect of your client profile. So historically, the approach has been to, you know, look at it differently. The responsibilities sit in different pockets of the business and, you um, uh, because of which the processes have been quite different in managing these two kind of uh, financial crime risk. But uh, the, the place where I see it differently and where I see the convergence happening is with the, uh, with the invent of technology and that being used for the purpose of AML and KYC activities. So I do see that the typical identity verification document frauds, internal rogue employee related stuff and transaction monitoring behavior all of this could be achieved through the single system that you look at. So from my perspective, it, it, do, it does uh, have a merit in terms of increasing your efficiencies, uh, reducing cost, and um, it also tries to kind of differentiate the type of bad actors that you come across and, uh, and how they get caught. So it, it, from, from the perspective of how you deal with them and how it kind of impacts your profiling and response to customers may be different, but I do see a point where from a technology perspective, those two things can converge and you know, the outcomes can be then managed uh, in, a, in a different approach. Thank you, Arthur. Um, so those are the, the questions. Um, that we've, we've discussed, but now we've got the, um, the questions from, from the audience. So there's quite a few that have come through. So I'll, um, I'll start with this one, which is, uh, what are the challenges of carrying out EDD within EKYC uh, slash FinTech once risks have been detected? In terms of cost, customer UX experience, have you seen many transactions abandoned due to further information requests? Is this suspicious? who's best suited to, to answer this one. Is it, again? Is it, is it so, on me, Sarah? Uh, yeah, potentially this is one for you, Nur. So what are the challenges of carrying out EDD within uh, EKYC slash FinTech once risks have been detected? Um, in terms of cost, customer UX experience, have you seen many transactions abandoned due to further information requests? Is Thank this you, suspicious? Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. So basically, for uh, to conduct enhanced customer due diligence uh, for a fintech ecosystem, whenever you have identified the risk exposure based on the maybe on the transaction analysis over the last one month or over the last two months, so when you identify the pattern is very volatile and it's not monotonous pattern, so you need to conduct enhanced customer due diligence on the customer. So the challenges would be actually is like is to uh, interact effectively with the customer. So you need to have a very good customer service team in order to be able to talk to them humbly, politely, and try to get the data. Because actually, when you conduct EDD, it is actually your existing customer, which they have provision all their basic uh, documentations and requirement for, uh, during the onboarding stage. So when you are conducting enhanced customer due diligence on the customer, by right, you must build the, rep the relationship with the customer so that they will have the trust and they will have the confidence to provide you additional documentation. For example, if let's say we have identified the normal customer that have been transacting maybe averagely of 
around 10,000 ringgit Malaysia for a month. And suddenly over the, over the last four to five months, they have been transacting instead of 10,000, they are transacting 50,000, they are transacting 100,000. So you might be able to request for their um, additional supporting documents such as, such as their bank statement, such as their salary slip, their recent, uh, their recent uh, income tax statement that they have been providing to the regulators. So you need to be able to, have, to build the relationship effectively to the customer so that they will be able to have the trust and confidence to provide you the documentation. And I think based on my previous experiences for the last 12 years, when you have built a good a relationship uh, with the customers, usually genuine customers, they will provide you the documentation. There's no argument. But if let's say the customer is having some dubious transactions, they are doing suspicious activities, usually they will get erupted and they will never provide you the responses. And to make things worse, they can even uh, go to social media and uh, say out loud that actually your customer service team is lousy and it's not efficient. So these are some of the pattern of customers that we have identified before. So it is very good to actually to have a very good customer service team who, who are able to talk effectively, professionally, polite and humble so that you can grab the attention of the customer to provide all these uh, additional supporting documents from them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, because have... usually compliance officer, we don't go direct to the customers. So it is actually the one who will be fronting the customer is actually our customer relationship manager or even our customer service team. So they are the frontliners. So besides uh, being uh, having a very good customer experience uh, and having a having an interpretation to have a very good customer journey you need to be able also to train your customer service team what are the do and the don'ts that they can talk to the customer and how actually they need to uh, have the uh, confidence and also try to grab the attention of the customer and by in fact to get all these supporting documents. So customer service team is actually very imperative. Besides having system, the human touch, I believe, is still the best option. <laughs> Thanks, Mo. Um, we do have uh, another question here, which is, um, do you consider it important to use industry partnerships to share knowledge, information, risks, and threats? And do you agree it's important that fintechs are able to sit down at the ACIP table or other public par uh, public private partnerships such as Gimlet internationally? Maybe Ufra, this is one for you. Um, so the two parts of the question, I guess, right? Can you repeat the first part? I, I didn't get that. Yeah, that's fine. So first part is, um, do you consider it important to use industry partnerships to share knowledge, information, risks and threats? Yes, I, I think that is really, really important to use the industry partnerships and uh, your fellow colleagues, because it's not that uh, things happen to you and your world in isolation. It's generally most of these are generic problems, more which each of our business kind of looks at. Uh, so I do, I am a proponent of sharing that information. Well, that said, when you talk about the risk, when you, you, you got to use your judgment in terms of whatever confidentiality and aspects of risk that you could share publicly and what you could not share. But once you are sorted out on that basis, I guess um, an industry partnership, and especially for the uh, fintechs is a very, very good uh, mechanism to kind of bring out issues. Because what I have seen is that the issues that we face are very different from uh, the, the issues that's faced in the traditional finance world because of, and, and, and a classic problem I always see is that we are all licensed as per the traditional financial world and the regulations are written to be, you know, applied to those uh, organizations or those type of businesses. The digital world or the fintech businesses are slightly different in that aspect and uh, they kind of have overcome certain requirements that the regulations have drafted for. And uh, therefore, I guess, a uh, collective uh, understanding and a plea to the regulator in terms of how we can actually mitigate those risks and how, how we as um, industry unit can kind of bring some confidence to the regulator. So to make all of this happen, we, we seriously need to have FinTech forums where we can share our ideas and thoughts and 
get some collective action as well. Thank you. And then um, I think we'll end with, with one final question. Um, and this is, what is your top one to two tips for reducing false positives when doing cross-border payments? Um, perhaps, Heather, this is one for you. Yeah, um, so happy to take that one. I, I say, you know, there are definitely more than a couple of ways to reduce false positives, but if we had to narrow this down to sort of the top one or two tips. Um, I think one, really segmentizing your customers um, according to your risk-based approach, um, the type of products they use, uh, the jurisdictions they're from, the risks associated with those clients, and treating those clients very differently for a higher risk client, potentially you might want to do, you know, further checks and a more complete kind of data set. Whereas maybe with a lower risk client, you can be more selective with the type of sources you want to screen them against. Um, that's already a huge way to reduce false positives. If we're just looking at adverse media alone, there's so much noise that can be generated through adverse media if we're looking at just the minor crimes, um, which may not be necessary if the client dealing with bears low risk. Um, the second tip I'd say is just looking at um, gathering good quality data from the customers. The more information you can put through the screening process, um, the, the better it is to help reduce uh, any kind of false positives. Thanks, Heather. Um, we do actually have time for one more question. So if that's of everyone's interest, um, I'll ask one more. Um, and this is, um, in relation to, um, I think, an opinion question here. So how concerned are you on compliance risk in fintechs or the startup environment, which are still not largely regulated by a central bank? Um, could this potentially create systemic risk? So I think this is here, um, fintechs that by law are required to partner with a, with a bank. If they're, if they're not, what are the risks that could be exposed here? Uh, maybe I'll throw one for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe not. Well, um, okay. I, th the way I look at it is that uh, whenever, uh, the, 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 from a regulator's lens, if they do believe that a certain type of activity or a financial service would kind of create a systemic risk, they will they will find ways to regulate it. So uh, that that concern would be addressed by the regulator. Now, uh, whether all type of fintechs uh, necessarily kind of create systemic risk, maybe not. So when somebody is partnering with a fintech, which is in the form of a solution provider, uh, it is in a, in a way that uh, the primary financial institution or the licensed entity still owns the responsibility of managing that risk and using the fintech solution more from a third party or a vendor for a perspective. What it means is that the risk here is still being dealt with by the primary regulated body. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that all fintechs bring about some form of systemic risk. And I am quite confident that the, the minute uh, the regulator starts sensing that this, an this is an area that could become a topic for systemic risk, I'm, I'm very confident that it will come into the regulatory clutches within no time. So there will be a supervisory oversight to it. I mean, unless there is something we are, the question is about any specific thing where uh, the, the attendee feels that, you know, there is no regulation, then that is something we could think about. But generally, this is the approach that most regulators take. Yeah, I agree with Otra. So basically, uh, most of the regulators, they are also trying to understand the fintech sphere. And I think uh, in Malaysia, for example, Bank Negara Malaysia is going to go for sandbox uh, in order to understand further this, the, the fintech ecosystem before they regulate for the fintech entities. So that's also one of the approach. And of course, in terms of technology, it is still new. There's a lot of limitation which is unknown. So it is difficult actually to regulate something that is unknown. But yes, but yet there's a tremendous powers uh, to combat and facilitating financial crime. Thank you. And thanks all. Um, you've that was a very fruitful discussion. You've all been a wonderful panel. Um, there are a few questions that haven't been answered, but as we mentioned, we, we can um, potentially come back to you with, with email on those. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you, and I hope you all enjoyed, and I will hand back to, to Josie. Thanks all.
Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, panel. Sarah, Na, Heather, Idra, Federick, thank you so much for squeezing so much into that allotted time and providing so much insight. And thank you very much for all those listening in and those questions, really great. A few exciting initiatives to share before we close. We believe our community is a reflection of who we are and who we hope to be. That's why we're excited to announce our first Kafka scholarship by FinTrail and ACAMS. The qualification enables you and your organization to demonstrate your financial crime preparedness and is designed to expand the compliance toolkit of an anti-financial crime professional working for a FinTech. If the qualification is of interest to you and your teams, please do get in touch. I've provided the link to the qualification in the chat function. Thought leadership content by FinTrail, including blog posts, the weekly FinTrail 5, and the increasingly popular monthly RegCap, which gives an update on all regulatory changes for that month in that specific region, can all be found on the FinTrail Insights page on the FinTrail website, and there is an option to subscribe. All content is available to anyone and not just FFE members. I've also provided the link to the FinTrail Insights page in the chat. The report Crypto Industry Insights and Good Practice is now out from our latest FFE Expert Working Group, where we gathered senior leaders um, from 16 um, fintech companies, the world's most aggressive crypto focused organizations. Experts joined us from across the crypto ecosystem, including exchanges, peer to peer marketplaces, and Bitcoin ATMs. Insights that came from our discussion covered hiring within the crypto industry, risk assessments, and upcoming regulation and more. Please do visit our expert working group page on the FFE website to download the full report. I've also added the link to that in the chat as well. If you are a FinCrime professional at a FinTech company and not yet a member of the FFE, but would be interested in joining, we would love to hear from you. So please do get in touch via me on LinkedIn or send an email to the FFE address provided on the screen here. And it's also in the chat box and you would have also received it from your Zoom confirmation email. Thank you again to all our speakers and thank you to the FinTrail team to help create these sessions. And thank you for you all for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your week and goodbye. <laughs>